Welcome to That Entrepreneur Life, a podcast about entrepreneurship that takes you from idea to launch and beyond. Beyond. Each week, your hosts, Andrew Lees and Clint McPherson, discuss different business topics aimed at adding value to any entrepreneur's journey. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of That Entrepreneur Life. I'm Andrew Lees, and I got my co-host here, Clint McPherson. What's up, man? How you doing today? Good, man. Everything's going awesome. New week. We've got a very special guest on the show today. He's the principal patent attorney for Blue Iron IP and has a business model that allows his clients to pay nothing up front to file their patent. So you're definitely going to want to stick around and learn more. Before I introduce our special guest today, I want to remind you to subscribe to our podcast, to our mailing list, through our website, so that you don't miss out on all the free resources we have to help you start and grow your business. With that said, I'd like to welcome our guest today, Russ Krajak, to the show. How are you doing, man? It's good to be here. Yeah, great to have you, Russ. Definitely awesome for you to be on the show. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to digging into our questions here. We'll just kind of... Um, let it roll organically, and I'm sure we'll have some great conversation. Fire away. So, Russ, I mean, we always, every guest we've had on the show, this is one of the, the throwback questions that we always that we always try to drive home first um, because we think it's important and it matches and it goes along with our, our podcast at Entrepreneur Life. Can you take us back, our audience, back to when your actual entrepreneurial journey started and what it is about entrepreneurship that really gets you fired up every day? Well, you know, I always wanted to, I always knew that I wanted to run my own business. And I started delivering newspapers back when I was, I don't know, 11 or 12. Um, and, you know, it was every morning I'd get up, load up the bicycle and go door to door, dropping off newspapers all around the neighborhood and then come back on Friday afternoons and collect and you know if i did a good job people tipped of course there's always that one that one lady who you know never mm -hmm. never gave you a dime you know we're talking about back in the day uh, you know a, a whole week 7 days of service was buck 25 for the whole you know it was Man, that's crazy back yeah. in the day but um you know i really understood the idea of doing it well if you did it well, people appreciated it and they, you know, you did, they paid you, you know, the mm -hmm. tips were definitely worth it. And you'd hear one person talk to their neighbor about, oh yeah, you ought to get, you ought to get the newspaper from Russ because he's reliable. Papers show up dry. They show yeah. up on time. And Not going to bust through your window or something at oh, five no. in the morning. I, I was like walking up to the front door and putting it in oh, between wow. the, the screen door and the, the regular door. Oh, that's, yeah, this yeah, is that's service. amazing service. Well, as you know, they don't do that anymore, but yeah. you know, I'm, I got some gray hair. Um, hmm. And then, it, it, you know, I always, that was always something I wanted to do is run my own business of some sort. And I didn't know what it was going to be. Um, became an engineer, worked in, in humongous companies, Hewlett Packard, McDonnell Douglas, um, and, um, did a little bit, you know, always knew, always looking for the, uh, that idea. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I knew it'd come eventually. I didn't know where, and I didn't know when, but I had, I'd been through the patent process a few times as an engineer at a big company where, you know, they hired outside patent counsel to do all the work. And I got the nice little bonus check, which was cool. Um, but I had an invention of my own and I wanted to license it. And I go to this patent attorney who's on my hockey team and the guy fleeces me for five grand to do two really bad searches. Mm. And I was furious so I happen to, uh, you know, I happen to have a friend who is going to take the patent bar exam. And as an engineer, you can sit for the patent bar, become a patent agent. So mm, okay. took the exam and wound up working for that attorney for about three years. And as 
you know, that was kind of my apprenticeship into the patent business, but I knew it was the crook. Hmm. And so, hmm. you know, my, I knew it was never going to work for him for the next 30 years or anything like that. I, right. but I absorbed, I absorbed everything I could. Right. I looked at every aspect of the, how does he find client? How do you, how do you number the, the files? How do you mm-hmm. set up the files? What, what's the, procedures about everything and how did the whole back office work? I, I, I wanted to absorb all that. And then I eventually went to law school when I was, I think I was 38 and he dorked with my pay one last time. And I'm like, okay, I'll go, I'll go solo. And I've been solo for a long time, you know, do the math, um, you know, 20 years. (laughs) Um, you know, and it's, it's the best, you know, I don't know. We were talking about this earlier. It, 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 being an entrepreneur, you have to come to terms with the stress of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The stress of, Oh, will I get paid next week? Yep. Or, you know, I, 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 I did all the work that I have and I don't know if any, any new work is going to show up. Yeah. Yep. That's just and, a new normal. That's just what you get. You go through the phase of restless, sleepless nights uh, yeah. for a while. And then you realize that, you know, hey, you just do everything you can do to make sure that you've got consistent business. And and then that's it. But yeah, absolutely. You Sometimes it's you looking one or two months down the road and you're not really sure what's going to happen. Then you get to the point where you're like, all right, it is what it is, you know? I don't, I don't know. It t- that took me 15 years to figure that out. Yeah. Like I was sure. all stressed. Okay. Oh, yep. I'm going to run out of work. What am I going to do next? I got to right. go out and hustle up some business. I, yeah. I got to be hustling. Got to be hustling. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's a way of life that, you know, I finally kind of got to the, I finally, you know, I'm far older than you, but it took me forever to figure this out of, you know, just take a deep breath. It'll show up, make sure you're doing, you know, kind of my model motto is show up and do the next right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Make sure you put your back into it. Make sure you're, uh, you know, putting the effort in and just figure out what's the next plan to do. Yeah. Um, In my current business, I've been, um, doing a lot of marketing and outreach and, you know, it, it, you know, I'm, maybe I'm a slow learner, but it took me a while to really figure out that if I could do outbound marketing or marketing in whatever form, if I could get new customers, new clients, I got a job for life. Right. Mm-hmm. Sure. And so get good at that. Oh, without Start a doubt. understanding that, you know, do a good website, do good outreach, do, you know, have good stories to tell and so on. Um, and you know, that really, um, I don't know, got me going in kind of the, you know, just keeps me motivated. Oh yeah. Just keeps nice. laying yeah. down, you know, laying down the marketing right? and hopefully somebody will call. Yeah, for sure. I really, I really think at the end of the day, it's all about positioning, right? I mean, you got to utilize what you've learned. You got to utilize any technique, whether it's outbound marketing, inbound, whether it's cold outreach, whatever it is that you know works that you've tried. And if you haven't tried, you need to try it. Email market. I mean, everything, everything matters. Um, your, Your audience can be on social and it's all about positioning yourself as that subject matter expert. Or as that per, per person that knows what this, you know, what, what, whatever niche you're in, it doesn't matter. It's just like you position yourself to get that client, line yourself up. And yeah, like you just, both of you just described, you're wondering, you no, know, maybe what's happening next week. Nobody's lined up because when I'm done with this client, I have nobody else on the books. So I really think, you know, as entrepreneurs, as we hustle, but as we learn, it's so important to continue to, you know, remind ourselves to not stop doing what got you where you're at, you know, just keep refining mm-hmm. and tinkering everything because 
you're in your position for a reason, right? And and you, and I believe everything's met and everything happens for a reason. So I'm I'm with you there. I, you know, uh, one of the experiences I had was. I had, you know, years ago, I'd posted like one or two things on LinkedIn and hadn't really done it much. Um, And then some guy gives me a call and he says, hey, you know, I saw your thing on LinkedIn and I've been meaning to call you. Hmm. And then I'm like, LinkedIn, I I had not posted on LinkedIn for two years. Mm -hmm. And this guy read it. It triggered something, but he wasn't ready at the time. Right. And two years later, the phone rings. And the, the thing about a lot of the a lot of the things that we do for marketing, you have no idea who read that. Oh right? yeah. And and you have no idea <laughs> if they're gonna be ready four years from now and they come back and hit you again and like, oh well, now I'm ready to engage you. Mm-hmm. It's it's weird. I mean, it's, how do you know, how do you value, how do you put a metric on that was successful? Right. Yeah. Know, and which one of those things worked and how do you rinse and repeat? It's, it's really, it's weird. It's hard to figure out. Oh yeah, no definitely. And, and especially with consulting, um, with, with, with what you do and with what I do with product development, you know, Every, every client is the, the lifetime value of a client is pretty high. I mean, much higher than, you know, if you compare that to selling like a standard, you know, just a con, uh, consumer product where, you know, the a consulting service is much more um, the revenue per customer is a lot higher. So yeah, you could just get one great lead and, you know, you could, you do one little thing, you have one, you do one post and then a couple of years later that turns into a, maybe that turns into a client and boom, it, you know, that it, it took a while, you know, and, but at the same time, you're, you're still, um, you're still getting a ton of value from that in the long, you know, in the long run. And then obviously if you're really consistent about it, you're, you know, you're doing that kind of thing, you're posting frequently and you're, you start to get some traction, you get more and more people on a regular basis, then, you know, then that's, you're going to see even more value, but yeah, it's amazing, especially with consulting, how you just, you can do one little thing, it works and it hits and you're, it it pays for itself. And then some. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough and you can't predict it and you can't refine it, you know, how do I know, you know, the badly written post that was, you know, years ago, yeah. and some it resonated with somebody like, how, how do I rinse and repeat that? Yep. I have no idea. Yep. Yeah. That, that, that something is, is, is again, you never know what that, when I, when I line up with clients and I talk to them about consistency, I think consistency of posting, whether it is on LinkedIn or social, wherever you, you did get a client or have some success, even though it was two years, like a post you did two years ago, you're like, how my mind, my mind is not even there no more. Whatever <laughs> that was, I, you know, it was like, like you said, a badly written post and somehow it resonated with that individual. But again, I, I really think as long as you stay consistent on a platform, whether it's LinkedIn and, and I think LinkedIn is a great platform to u- utilize, especially for businesses that, I mean, cause you're talking to mostly business owners. Right. And so that makes a big, um, you know, impact there. But I mean, again, like consistency, consistency, post what's on your mind, you know, document and, and just whatever it is, um, you just go along the whole route. And, and I really think again, you never know. And how do you measure that? I don't think you can, because how can you go back and say, well, dang, man, I posted that two years ago. Now let's let me see how long it takes for another person to reach out for, f- from this post. Is it another two years? Because I mean, you yeah. can you know that's you just got to be consistent and, and go back. And, and you said it's a bad written post. Make it sharp. Make it you know better. Yeah. Um. Get and, that, and get and that then, much and more. And then just engagement. adapt it, right? So. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's a tough, you know, it's a tough deal. I don't know what's, I don't know what's, how to, how to repeat that. And, you know, my, kind of my philosophy now, now that I had that, that unfortunate experience, I'm like, well, okay, I'll just keep posting on LinkedIn. So, you know, so I'm top of mind. 
Right. And I real I realize now that a lot of these posts are, you know, nurturing, I guess you can call it where I'm right. just, I just, you know, Oh yeah. That patent thing. I want to talk. Yeah. He's the guy I wanted to talk to and I'm just kind of hanging around. Exactly. Keeps you top of mind and it helps with algorithms too, right? Like LinkedIn wants you to be, they want you to, to engage with their platform as much as possible. They want you to pretend like no other platform, nothing else exists in the world. And you're all in a hundred percent on LinkedIn, which obviously nobody is all in a hundred percent on any platform usually. Right. So, but the more, like Clint was saying, the more you do on the more consistent you are, the, the better it is for actually reaching for, you know, for actually reaching your customers or your potential customers and for, and for the algorithm for the platform that you're on. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think that's, it, it is tough to measure that ROI. You kind of go with a baseline with what's working short term and then anything else that comes along is like gravy on, you know, right. on top of that. Exactly. So yeah, it's tough to measure for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, Especially if it's one out of a thousand people that read that post, you know. Yeah, and and a lot of times, so I think that's what a lot of people don't don't realize is in you know in business, the numbers. Like I remember explaining this to somebody that the numbers game of it, right. you know, and then they were kind of amazed with with how you know how low conversions are. So you have you, you run an ad or you do you know you you post something on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. And yeah, you might have a thousand people see that. And you, if you know, you, you're probably out of, let's say out of a hundred, make it easier out of a hundred people who see that maybe one person clicks between one and 10, 10, if you're doing incredibly well. Right. And then of the, of that, of those 10 people, let's say who click, um, maybe one person purchases yeah. and, and if you're lucky and those are those are actually really <laughs> 10 to pretty, one that's glorious yeah exactly <laughs> so yeah so so really you're looking at more like um the, you know a thousand people view 10 people click um one person purchases yeah. oh even that and, yeah. and even that yeah that that that's yeah you know usually it, one usually one to three <laughs> Three percent, you're doing real three percent conversion. Once you've already gotten somebody over to your website, is is actually really great, and especially for higher ticket products and services like what you're doing. Yeah, I started out as a as a patent agent, and I didn't know where to start. I, you know, I need to find people who need patents, and so I I started going to networking meetings. I I started writing a blog. This is 2003, maybe. Um, the people that came in over the internet were terrible. They were, you know, they're bottom feeders looking for cheap. They, they wanted, they wanted low cost. They want, you know, and so that was a tough client. They asked too many questions. They're too needy and they don't have money. And I really realized something about pricing. If you price yourself low, you get treated like that. I happened to stumble into a gig as a solo attorney where Microsoft started sending work to solo and small firm people. And I actually tried out, I was one of the first people to try out for their little program and it kind of, it was slow going, but once they started sending work, it was just, it was glorious. It was fantastic. They were sending tons and tons and tons of work. It was ridiculous. And I was just grinding out work. Like it was going out of style and I was having a ball doing it. I had the opportunity to, um, start co-found a company with Bill Gates's technical advisor, which was, you know, pretty interesting. So we That's started cool. a company out in Seattle and Seattle area. And, um, you know, and I went in house and I got, got to work for free. Um, you know, my, my lifestyle went different, you know, it yeah. changed. Um, and there was a point where I had burned through my cash and I needed, I needed to get a salary. And he said, fine, you know, whatever you need, just tell me what the number is. I'll pay you. Not a problem. And so I gave him a number that covered all my expenses. I had not been on a salary for 15 years at that point. And all of a sudden I had salary to cover all my expenses. 
name your price, salary, any, and what are, you know, I had to be reasonable because, you know, I had ownership in the company. I didn't want to, you know, my goal was not to make a million dollars, but, you know, cover my expenses. And, and I tell you, uh, the, the most interesting part about that is I felt trapped. I felt trapped by a salary. Mm -hmm. When I'm able to go hustle up some work and find a new client and onboard them, I make more money, right? It's upside. When I'm a salaried and I, you know, stay, I work till 10 o'clock at night or come in on the weekends, I get the same salary. It's like, right. it's like I yeah. felt. I felt like there was a ceiling. That's on, the thing, yeah. And and I it, it shocked me. I was surprised. I had worked as a salaried engineer for a bunch of years. I knew what that felt like, but having been away from it and living kind of that entrepreneur, got a hustle all the time. Man, I was surprised by that. Really shocked. Yeah. So so Russ, I want to talk about your business model now in your business. Sure. Um, your IP business, because I think it's, it's really interesting. It's, um, something that a model that I've thought about when I worked for another, for, for a consulting, an engineering consulting firm, I really wanted to do this, but, but I think it's tough. And, and that is you, you help finance the upfront costs of a patent for your clients. Maybe not everybody, but some people, and you have to qualify, I, th I think that's really cool because it it puts you know you have skin in the game, so you want to only work with the companies who um, and the and the ideas and technologies that you think are going to be really valuable because you know you you've got some interest in it being successful, and you're going to work that much harder probably um, you know to make sure that it is successful. So. You, can you talk about how that works and how, and then how do clients pay? Is it, it's after the patent's been filed? Is it with, mm -hmm. you know, is it with earnings after the, you know, the, um, the patent becomes revenue positive? How does that work? Well, you know, this whole idea started because I hated the conflict of interest between the patent attorney and the inventor. The patent attorney makes money by selling hours by selling patents. And I've had my share of, of inventors come in with an idea that you just, you just, you know, put your hand, your head in your hands and say, no, please don't do this. Right. And they, they're convinced that it's going to be a great idea. And, you know, I, I don't think it will be like but, a new perpetual motion machine or yeah, something perpetual like that. motion machine guy <laughs> calls like once a quarter. Um, uh, yeah. You know, I get always. cold fusion guy about once a year or two, but, <laughs> you know, they always seem to find me, but I can't tell them no, because I'm their attorney. I'm their mm -hmm. agent. You want a patent, you go to a patent attorney and they are legally, morally, and ethically required to do that, to write up the patent application the best they can send it to the patent office, no matter how bad the invention is. Mm -hmm. And then when I was working for that attorney, when I first started, you know, he really turned on the schmooze for, for inventors. If you tell them, Oh, that's the, that's the best invention I've ever seen today, you know, and, Oh, congratulations. This is a really big step for you. And this is going to, you know, and you make, a, you make them feel warm and welcome and, yeah. and, and and addicted, they'll come back for more and more patents all day long because the patent attorney is the only one who loves the idea. Right. Yeah. The customers don't like it. The, you know, the business, nobody else, nobody else like, but the patent attorney does because they're paid up front. Sure. And, and that's the, that conflict of interest was how do I, how do I build a business model that gets around that? And the business model is that I'll finance the patents. Mm -hmm. And essentially, I built it like a leaseback model where you don't have to own the asset, you get full control of it, and you can pay it off at some point in the future. And the truth is, I've been doing this for, a, you know, I've done a couple dozen deals like this, and I, I handcraft it and I try different pricing structures, I, you know, try different payback mechanisms and so on. But in general... We structure it like a loan and the loan becomes due when the patent issues. 
And so typically we pay interest only payments until, you know, there's a little bit of a heartbeat of a payment that you got to keep going. Then once the patent issues, which might be several years down the road, if, you know, if we, if we design the patent system that way, a couple of years down, we can do it fast or we can do them slow or whatever, but say three years down the road, the patent comes issues, then the, the full amount will become due and you get three years or so to pay it off. And so instead hmm. of front loading cost, we back load it and okay. let you, you know, pay it off over time. I, I mean, I think that's a really cool way to do it. And if, if people or if clients are smart, they'll use that time to really dig in and find out what the, you know, what the real value of their product is and te test market it, get it out there, you know, and, and make sure that they at least get some good feedback and make sure they're on the right track with, you know, with the idea, see if they need to change anything, go through, mm -hmm. spend some money with for product development and test marketing and all this stuff so that when they, when kind of, you know, they need to start paying you back, they're already hopeful. If, you know, if everything goes well, they're cash flow positive, you know, right. at, at least they're making some money with it. And in fact, I usually want the entrepreneur to start a lot of that stuff. I want them to do some test marketing. I want them to build the prototype. I want them to, you know, I want them to start taking risk off of this business before yep. I do the patent. Yep. Like a, one of the biggest mistakes people make is, you know, they have some idea and then let's write up a patent and let's, you know, let's file the patent today. But that's where we have the least amount of information, right? We mm -hmm. haven't built the product. We haven't cost reduced it. We haven't done it in volume. We haven't, haven't done our marketing message. We don't really know what the customer wants. Uh, the, it, filing a patent at the beginning is almost always the worst thing you can do. Hmm. You want to wait yep. until you know more. Wait yeah. until you solve that engineering problem of, yeah, I, yeah, I kind of know this doesn't really work, but I haven't really fixed it yet. The fix that you're going to make is the same fix that all your competitors are going to make. And, exactly. so, and that could have a huge impact on the claims that you write. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so you really want to get a patent on just that thing that your competitors are, that problem that your competitors are going to have to solve later on right. down the road. Right. Because if you write it, idea. Yeah. Yeah. If you write in the beginning and you, you write claims around something that ends up not working. And in the meantime, your competitors figure out the right way to do it. And they patent that they just totally bypass your patent. And, you know, you just wasted a, several Except years and a bunch of money. I've, I've had, I had that happen with a client. He came to me after he had already, he waited until his patent had been issued Mm -hmm. uh, his patent had also been written really, really, really poorly, in addition to not covering the best features of the product. And it was, it was actually yeah. written. I, I'm not actually <clears throat> sure how anyone would think this was a good idea, but it was written so that there were like four or five main features of the product. And the way that he wrote it was that each one had to be true, you know, to make it part of the, the IP. And if any yeah. one, any one of those things was taken out, then so like literally somebody could come along with an inferior product, less features, but yeah. it would bypass the product, you know, the patent protection, which was just the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. But so he, he kind of <clears throat> tossed that money down the drain and had to rewrite it. I think, um, just start from scratch. He couldn't even do a continuation. I don't think. Oh, poor guy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, yeah. that happens all the time. Um, but, you know, part of the problem is just the legal system. Sure. If you're a first time inventor, if you're the, you know, the, like when I went to that patent attorney who was on my hockey team, he wanted me out of the office. He did not <laughs> want to talk to me. He did not want, because uh, sure. what am I going to be to him? I'm, I'm going right. to be a one and done. He's not going to make much money off me. I'm, I'm going to hound him all with all kinds of questions. Right. Yep. I'm going to be a needy client. And he's not going to make money off me. But if he could get, you know, some big corporation that's going to send him a hundred patents a year, well, you know, that, that 
big company, that big client is going to get, you know, the, the top, attention. you know, yeah, they're going to get the best treatment. But as the independent inventor, the first timer, nobody wants to, nobody wants to deal with you. Mm-hmm. And f- for good reason. And so you typically get the bottom of the barrel. Now, I, I look at a lot of part of my part of my business, not just financing the patents now. Now we can do insurance on patents. We can insure, give you essentially write an insurance policy that will allow you to enforce your patents on an insurance policy. So you're not paying out of pocket to go after a competitor or defensive where you're selling a product and somebody sues you. You yeah. can insure for us. Right. We can That's also huge. do loans using patents as collateral. Like there's one company that did a hundred million dollar loan just on a IP wow. portfolio. So we can wow. finance the, the companies and all that stuff's available, but like nobody knows it exists. That's, right. a, that's a part of, part of the, you know, that part of the ecosystem is kind of left on its own, mostly because somebody wants a patent, they go to a patent attorney and the patent attorney knows how to do the, and you know, they're trained to get stuff through the patent office. Right. And that's where their duty of care ends. They're not responsible for making this thing into a multi-million dollar project. That's yours. Exactly. You, you know, the business, you're the entrepreneur. My job is to provide this one tool for you. Um, and so there's very few people that kind of cross over from how do I create this asset to how do I create a valuable asset? Mm-hmm. And ever since I had that conversation with that one attorney, I've wanted to reverse engineer that patent system. How do I figure out, is this invention going to be good? Is it going to be valuable? How can I enforce it? How can I sell it? Who's the, you know, who does it read on? How do I, how do I make something valuable? Not how do I make a plaque on the wall? I can do that. Those are easy. How do I make one that's really valuable? That's, that's a whole different art in and of itself. Yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. I mean, Russ, I mean, and with this conversation and where we're at right now, I really think this ties good into this, the, the follow on question. Um, and some of the stuff you've already touched on, but there's a myth that getting a patent ensures success. I mean, but in reality, a patent might not be valuable and you still have to fight it. Can you talk about that and what are some situations where it's not smart to get a patent? Um, the myth that the patent does ensure success of the patent attorney. Right. Okay. <laughs> that, don't, right. <laughs> don't miss that out. I'm a patent attorney. You know, we, we got to eat. Okay. So yeah. yeah. You know, um, you know, that there's, there's a trade-off with everything. Life is a bunch of trade-offs and patents are no different. When you get a patent, you're trading off your trade secrets. And in exchange, you get this thing called a patent. Now, um, you know, Andrew, you just said, you know, gave one example of right. somebody who got a patent that, turned out to be worthless. A right. lot of people will get patents on things that turn out to be undetectable. Think right. about some machine learning, AI, blockchain nonsense, you know, algorithm. It, I could never detect that a competitor is using my algorithm. So right. why would I put it in a patent? If I put in a patent, all I'm doing is saying, okay, here's everything that's in my, everything I was thinking about, everything, I, you know, here's my whole business yeah, plan. Yeah, it there in the, into the public domain. Yeah. yeah, here, have it for free and then compete with me. And you go to a patent attorney and they're, they're going to tell you, well, maybe you shouldn't do this, but, oh, I want one really bad. Well, okay. I'm, I'm your agent. I have yeah, to do it. I'll do and, it, and, sure. You know, it's not that the patent attorneys are bad people. It's just, this is what the relationship means Mm -hmm. that if you want one and you insist on it and you write a check, you get one. And um, there's a lot of examples of things that are undetectable that get patented. And then you look at them later and just, oh, you know, you could have had this huge competitive advantage 
and you washed it all away because you got a patent. Right. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, you're, you're, you're putting it out there. You're putting it out there for people to copy if they want, because you're going to, at the end of the day, you really are most, a lot of things are going to get copied no doubt. and you, you really can't avoid that. And that goes into Clint's question about, about how, how do you fight a patent, you know, and it's. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. There is this big discrepancy between, oh, I have a patent and, you know, I'm, I'm going to be rich and famous. Um, what happens when somebody knocks off your invention? Well, you know, you kind of look around and patent lawsuits are brutally expensive, you know, in the, in the three to $5 million range. And people don't have that kind of cash. Okay. And even big companies struggle with, uh oh, you know, $5 million outlay that I didn't expect is really tough. One of the routes is you go to contingency fee attorney and you, you call up, you know, this is the, this is the ambulance chaser side of patents. I'll do it on mm. contingency and I'll take some percent. Mm -hmm. And it's not small, you know, it could be 40 to 60%. And then, oh, by the way, you've got to pay for all the expert witnesses. You still have fees and stuff. It's, it's not cheap, but that part of the industry exists for, you know, to help out people who can't afford to enforce their patents, you know, and they get to write it as patent trolls or whatever, but, you know, they're a very, very important part of, of the the ecosystem that that makes sure that patents can be enforced. Yeah. The alternative is that you can buy insurance and insurance for a startup company, you know, I think a patent or two, or you can actually get a reasonable amount of enforcement coverage for like 250 bucks a month. Mm. It's, wow. Yeah. You know, it's not, you know, it's not going to get you to the Supreme Court and back. Okay. But it'll be <laughs> enough that when somebody infringes that you have a hammer that you can pay the attorneys to go start negotiating something with them. And it might be a license agreement. It might be them to cease and desist or whatever. Yeah. And that's something that most people aren't thinking about, you know, I'm patent insurance, um, I honestly hadn't thought too much about that myself, but it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it's like I tell my clients, Hey, it's, you know, patent is as good is is only as good as your, the amount of money and the amount of effort you're willing to defend it with. Yeah. So if you have just enough money to get a patent and then that sort of makes you cash poor, then that's going to be a problem because there's a lot For of sure. other things that you need to do. And then if you need to defend it, well, you, that's it. I mean, I guess yeah. you could, you could definitely say that there's value in just having it as like, you know, people who have security systems on their, their homes, you put a dirty sign out front that says, mm -hmm. Hey, this house is protected by whatever, you know, and some people put them out there without actually having the, you know, the home security system. So right. at least it's like that where, okay, people are less likely to mess with you and mess with that idea probably. Um, but if they want to go after you, they're a lot of times they're just going to go after you. One of my friends here in Colorado had a, a business where they, they had a, like a chat, an automated chat bot kind of piece of software. And they struggled to sell it like all entrepreneurs do, but they finally landed a big company. I think it was like, it was, it was some big broadcast company, you know, like NBC or somebody who had, you know, lots of websites and they put this product on one of their websites. Well, all of a sudden NBC with this product becomes a target to litigation and a patent troll tuned up. NBC with a lawsuit for my buddy's product that was on their website. And of mm. course, NBC says, this is your problem and passes yeah. it down to yeah. the, the entrepreneur who he didn't have it. He didn't have patent insurance at the time. He didn't have the, the means, you know, they were just guy in his garage level kind of business. NBC was looking at him to, this is your problem. You have to indemnify me you have to deal with this lawsuit. 
and they looked at it and said, we can't afford it. And so they shut the whole business down. Hmm. Yeah. Everything they worked for just, well, just gone. what are my options? Yeah. I'm not making enough money to justify a huge lawsuit. I can't right. do the contingency fee thing. I like every, it, they just had to shut down. And it's crazy. That's what, well, you know, a lot of small companies, who's going to sue you if you're selling a hundred thousand dollars worth of product, but right. you sell a hundred thousand dollars worth of product through a big name, you know, uh, some marquee customer or whatever, all of a sudden you're a far bigger target than you thought for inbound right. litigation. And, right. you know, you pick up a, a typical policy will cost you about, uh, you know, somewhere on the order of a per percent or two per the, the coverage value. So a million dollars of prepaid legal fees to go after, you know, indemnify or go after somebody would cost you about $10,000 a year. Mm. So, you know, less than a thousand bucks a month. Yeah. So you, you work it into the budget and like, you know, you can live it. It's something that you need to think about. Yeah. As right. an option. Especially when you are, when you lean very heavily on your IP, when that's a, you know, a, a big part of kind of the backbone of your, <laughs> of your business, maybe, um, maybe with, especially with like medical products, let's say where, it's, it's really, really important to have IP because there's big guys, you know, out there who, who are kind of ready and willing to, to knock you off and, um, and eat your lunch. So sure. yeah, when, when you really need, when you really have that, IP, you need to rely yeah. on your IP. That makes a lot of sense. And, and like you said, there's, there's cases where it's not as important to, you know, to maybe even file for a patent at all. And you just kind of, if you do get a patent and, you know, you have that protection to some degree, but you just kind of roll the dice and, mm -hmm. and go for it. But that, I mean, that insurance sounds like a great idea. Yeah. And you're right about medical device. It's very common for the big players in the medical device industry to just rip you off and yeah. then, you know, come sue me. Yeah. And, oh, I'm sorry. Like, oh, <laughs> I got your lawsuit. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll fix that. Yeah. You yeah. Know, they don't, that's just efficient for, you know, this notion of efficient infringement. Mm -hmm. um, it's what they do. And that's, you know, that's how the game's played. So you got to know it. Yep. Yeah. You got to, got to know what niche you're in and, and how to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. So Russ, through your entre entrepreneurial journey from the highest to the lows, what has been the hardest thing for you about being an entrepreneur? Um, you know, it, the hardest thing is probably the, you know, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse that, that thing we talked about earlier where, oh, you know, I don't know where the next, you know, where my next meal's coming from, <laughs> you know, right. you can't really forecast very far in advance, you know, how the business is going to go or where the sales are going to come in, you yep. trust that they do. Um, that is hard. That stress level is for me just never goes away, but I'm yeah. always thinking about that. Oh yeah. I got to, you know, well, you know, should I lay around on a Saturday afternoon or should I knock out a blog post? <laughs> right. <laughs> I probably should do that. Yep. You know, there's, that's always there, but there's a, when you really kind of embrace it and say, this is my motivation. You use it as a motivating factor. You know, it's not the carrot uh, to me the the carrot of, oh, I'm going to be, you know, richer than God and have all this money, you know, and uh, whatever infinite success looks like. Mm -hmm. That's not really as motivating as, you know, <laughs> oh, shoot, I really got to I really got to put the effort in here. You know, yeah. it's time to really, you know, pour the coals to it and, and make it work. Um, that to me, it's a, you know, it's the flexibility of it, the. um the ability to try something new is mm -hmm. so much fun. Yeah. You know, you just think, Oh, you know what? I'm going to try going after a different market segment. I'm going to try going after something, you know, I've, I've always wanted to do this. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and if it doesn't work can, yeah. that fear of failure that I was in corporate America and, Oh yeah, I want to, you know, I want to, run my own business, but I got this, you know, I got a nice healthcare plan, uh, you know, I get three weeks of vacation or whatever it is, you know, Oh, I can't get rid of that. You know, I can't lose all that. It, it, the, 
And the fear that you're going to fail at that is once you kind of taste it a little bit and know that you're not going to fail or you mm-hmm. come up to that edge, you're like, you know what? I'll it, figure it, figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. The world doesn't come to an end. I'm not having to live b- underneath a bridge. You know, it's yeah. Uh, right. Things are pretty I, good. I kind of thought that was going to happen when, when I first, when I quit my, my job and just went, you know, jumped in and went full time with my business, it was a really scary, scary moment. But, um, when you realize, yeah, that you're, you're going to figure out a way to get through things, you know, and you might have to tighten your belt or you might have to, you know, you've really got to think on your feet. And I think it's, uh, I think it really sharpens you quickly because you, you have to fend for yourself. Um, and something you said earlier really resonated with me with when you were, when you went back to a salary after being away for it for so long, you felt like there was a ceiling there. I think that's the difference. I think the, the exciting thing is every day you could land a client or do something in your business that takes you to that next level. And you could from one year to the next, I was telling somebody about this recently in because they were they were asking how does how does your salary compare to when you work for for another consulting firm and i said well first of all it's better second of all it could be double next year and i can't do that working for the, the other company i just can't do you can't do that you can't be like hey you know what my my salary was uh was this this year can you give me a 100% raise is that, yeah. it's like, you're going to get nope. like one to two, maybe three. Yeah. You get a few <laughs> percent if you're lucky and they'll make you feel bad about it. And right. you know, and then it just keeps going on for years. And it's like, mm-hmm. so that's another huge difference is the, that potential. And I would I, agree. Yeah. I think I agree hundred yeah. percent. I think when it comes down to it as an entrepreneur, the sky's the limit, but you also have the ceiling could be as low as you want it to be. And the ceiling doesn't even have to be there. Right. Because mm-hmm. you do have to get out there and grind and make things happen. You got to position yourself, like I said, to be in position to land a client. Um, mm-hmm. Communication totally. with individuals is, is yeah, you very important. Show up exactly. Showing That's up every it. day. Yep. That is what people don't understand, uh, and a lot of individuals that I see fail are, are are give up, right? Because they don't show up every day. They think it's going to be easy because they see someone like, you know, Andrew, myself, or anybody else. It's like getting where we got right here, right now, has not been easy. The path is not just like, okay, I decided to do this, like the field of dreams quote, you build it, they'll come. Yeah. No, you have to make things happen. It's <laughs> not true. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you don't understand. I had to grind to get where I'm at and position myself and some of the decisions I made, you know, and, and I really believe in the law of attraction. And when you start lining yourself up, you start believing, you start actually, you know, telling yourself that you're going to be successful. That stuff comes to fruit. Makes when you difference. when you plant those seeds and, and and it helps me get up in the morning, like I you know you got to look at the person in the mirror every morning and tell yourself whether you're stressed out or not. Look, I'm about to make it happen today. I mean that's that's it. That's my attitude. Every morning I get out, I might not want to get up. I'm like, dang, dude, five o'clock or maybe ten, whatever, whatever <laughs> time I wake up. But I'm like, you got to get up. You got to keep moving forward and make things happen because again. I'm in control of this, right? Like I, it's my business. I'm in control of my success and my failures. And once you start understanding that, and once you start knowing that you actually have the control and stop blaming everybody else about your lack of success, man, it makes life so much easier. You know, you know what changed for me too over the years is that I, when I was in, you know, sitting in the cubicle, I'd think, okay, here's what life would be like if I was on my own doing whatever. And, you know, here's what my income would be. Here's my daily routine would be, you know, kind of, and I, I, you know, I, I do the daydreaming bit where you'd think Mm. about all that kind of stuff. Or when I, you know, when I would start a new project or, you know, start a new business line or, you know, whatever I was kind of in, in my journey, I'd take a different step and I'd, okay, this is what I envision life to be like. I quit doing that. Yeah. I used to live yeah. in that kind of world of, oh, you know, uh, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to, and here's my goal. This, this idea of having goals doesn't work for me. 
What hmm. the, if I give up those goals, if I just say, here's what I need to, you know, planting the seeds through this marketing effort, joining this group and getting to know people in it, or, right. you know, whatever the thing that I'm doing that makes sense for the business. Does this make sense for the long term? Yes, it does. Okay, I'll do it. And I'll do it to the best of my ability, you know, as much energy as I have for that thing. And I will see where it goes. And the fun, the best part about this is seeing where the journey leads. I sure. never would have thought that I would have been starting up a, a company, you know, in Seattle with, you know, a, a whole bunch of really smart people. I never would have thought about that. It, it, it happened. I was like, huh this is interesting. Let's try right. that. And uh, what am I going to learn from that? Uh, the other thing I do is I try to take on things that will add to my skill stack. I want to know, uh, I, I was thinking about inventing for a living. I wanted to do product development uh, back when I was at HP and doing, you know, work in the cubicle. And I had the opportunity and, I was, you know, my idea was, hey, I'm going to invent stuff. I'm going to write patents on it and then I'm going to license it to people. Well, I had the opportunity to take a job at Waterpick up, up here in Colorado. They make we make shower heads, you know, the shower massage by Waterpick or the oral, a lot of oral care, toothbrushes, yeah. and that kind of stuff. And I wanted to be on the inside of a business that was licensing in product licensing and ideas. I wanted to see how it worked. I wanted to see what, how they thought, how they evaluated the ideas, what they did. And so, Oh, and by the way, I got all that information and they paid me, right. I'm, mm. I'm there as an engineer and, you know, doing, doing engineering work, but yeah. I was watching how all this stuff worked. And so that when I got to the outside, I, you know, and thinking, okay, I'm going to license into these kind of places. I knew what to expect. Mm. And, you know, I try to look for things that I can do next that will add to that skill stack. Sure. How, how do I get some experience in this that I don't have today? And then intentionally take some, take a job or a project or whatever that will help me learn that. Yeah. And when you, when you do that intentionally, instead of by accident, I always did, a, I did it mostly by accident. Um, I think that there's so much, you know, you can be much more efficient in your time and, and, and more doors open, the better the skill stack, the better the doors that open, mm -hmm. you don't know where they're going to be or when they're going to show up, but they're there. Agree. hundred percent. So Russ, as we wrap up this episode, I, I feel like we could talk all day. If you could only leave, if you can leave our listeners with one piece of advice and you might've already touched on it, what would that be? Just keep plugging forward. You know, don't think about, um, think about what you're doing and why, and, and what am I learning from this exercise and how do I build, um, you know, how do I build my skills, use the skills that I have that are, that, you know, where I can, where I can mac maximize their potential. I have a good skill. I want to, I want to do that more, but what else, what other skills need to complement that and try to, force yourself to learn those and force yourself to get good at those other things too, and not be just the one trick pony and just be, be deliberate about choosing opportunities so that you learn choosing opportunities that add to that skill stack that you have. I love, it. I love that. Yep. Well, guys, I think that's a wrap for this episode. And from the both of us, Russ, we want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us and adding value to what we're doing on our podcast, brother. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks for your opportunity. Yeah, it's been really great talking to you, Russ. And like Clint said, we could probably talk to you for a while. So we'll have to have you back on at some point. Thank you all so much for listening to That Entrepreneur Life. To learn more about what Russ is working on, check out blueironip.com. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to our podcast and don't forget to download our free ebook about the success mindset at thatentrepreneurlife.com. Thanks for continuing to support what we do as entrepreneurs and don't forget to join us next week for another episode of That Entrepreneur Life. Thanks for listening to That Entrepreneur Life podcast. 
Be sure to visit thatentrepreneurlife.com to join the conversation, access our show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode as we continue to add value. Until next time.